they are preying on that most vulnerable kind of Skinner box operant conditioning vulnerability. They are preying on the worst kind of psychological vulnerability. And that is why you shouldn't do this to children and probably should disclose this to adults in a, in a more clear fashion. All right, next I want to talk about this young people and gambling study out of Great Britain, dated this month, November 2018. It talks about gambling generally, but it does have a section here for online participation, which has a section about in-game items. And that's what I really wanted to go over. But first, we will also make sure that you all know about Ms. Kaylee's fundraiser she is doing. She is going to sleep rough in the park. I'll ask her to speak some more about it. And I think we have a, I don't know, we have a website here someplace with more information. Let's cover the headlines here. And then we'll talk a little bit about operant conditioning, anxiety and anticipation anxiety. And, um, and then we'll have a kind of a discussion about what's going on with Belgium and Kingdom Hearts, and what was the other one? There was another one that got kicked out. So the headline findings are that 14% of 11 to 16 year olds have spent their own money in gambling in the past week, the past seven days, up from 12%, but still lower than prior rates, compared to 13% who had drunk alcohol, 4% who had smoked cigarettes, and 2% who had taken illegal drugs. Principal forms of gambling are placing a private bet, 6%, national lottery scratch cards, 4%, fruit or slot machines, 3%, and playing cards for money with friends, 3%. Young people who have gambled in the past week spent an average of 16 pounds, or what is that, approximately $20, $24, 20, 20 some dollars US. Over the past 12 months, 39% of 11 to 16 year olds have spent their own money on gambling. That's 12 months, 39%. Online participation, 5% of 11 to 16-year-olds have spent their own money online gambling in the past 12 months, 1% in the past week. 6% have gambled using a parent or guardian's account, 13% have played gambling-style games online, and 31% have opened loot boxes in a computer game or app to try and acquire an in-game item. And 3% claim to have bet on skins gambling, which is different from loot boxes. 1.7% uh, of 11 to 16-year-old are classified as problem gamblers, 22 are at risk, and 32.5% are classified as non-problem gamblers, as in the DSM-4's description of it. Boys tend to have an elevated rate of problem gambling, 2%, than girls, 1.3%. 59% agree that gambling is dangerous. 14% agree that it is okay for someone to gamble. 49% say that someone has spoken to them about the problems gambling may lead to. 66% have seen gambling advertisements on TV, 59% on social media, 53% on websites. 49% see or hear TV or radio programs sponsored by a gambling company, or 46 have encountered gambling sponsorships at sports venues. 7% claim they have been prompted to gamble by a gambling advertisement or sponsorship, and 12% follow gambling companies on social media. 26% of young people have seen their parents gamble, 60% of young people think their parents would prefer them not to gamble. However, only 19% stated that their parents set strict rules about gambling with no negotiation. The latest annual survey by the Gambling Commission to explore gambling behavior among young people in Britain found that 14% of 11 to 16 year olds had spent their own money on gambling. Overall, the pattern of young people's participation in different gambling activities remains broadly similar to previous years. That's funny because the headline, and we got this from, was that gambling had doubled. Rates of online gambling remain relatively low, with only 1% having spent their money to gamble online, 5% having done so in 12 months. However, not all online gambling involves spending young people's own money. 
6% have gambled using a parent or guardian's account with or without permission. 13% have played online gambling style games. And 31% claim to have paid money or used in-game items to open loot boxes to get other in-game items within a computer or app-based game and 3% claim to have ever bet with in-game items on websites outside the game or privately with friends. So let's skip a little bit to this um, beautiful infographic. You can see that in 2011 here, there was a higher rate of past week gambling. This is all gambling. We're not talking about in-app or in-game gambling. We're talking about uh, actual regular gambling. So that's, that's an interesting infographic. I'm not sure it says anything different than what we've seen, but here's a way to visualize. It isn't exactly up. It's up from last year. It's down from every other year. So that's a little bit of misinformation to some of these articles that are saying it is, it is uh, doubled. It is not doubled. It does not look like it has doubled at all. New questions for 2018. Awareness and uses of loot boxes. Here, the primary gambling activities seem to be slot machines, placing bets, bingo, national lottery for regular gambling. Apparently, 57% of young people do know it's illegal, and 55% of them are just simply not interested. That's not necessarily the same 57 and 55%, everybody, just statistics. Keep that in mind. Here we go. Online gambling. So let's see, what kinds of online gambling? National lottery online, national lottery online without permission, Uh, other gambling websites with permission, other gambling websites without permission. 94% of 11 to 16-year-olds said that those sentences don't apply to them. We are talking about online gambling-style games such as roulette, poker, slot machines, or bingo. This section does not include loot boxes, it appears. And you can see this sort of reflected here. They're usually played using an app, not social networking, or using Facebook or other social networking apps. Did you know you can play gambling-style games on, on Facebook? I didn't know that. Wow. There's all kinds of games on Facebook. Slots, poker, all kinds of stuff. And then they go on. Here's the section about awareness and usage of in-game items. Skins are in-game items used within some of the most popular video game titles. They provide cosmetic alterations to the player's weapons, avatar, or equipment. Skins betting sites allow video gamers to wager cosmetic items rewarded in-game or purchased for real money on a digital marketplace accessible from the UK for several years. The Gambling Commission takes the view that the ability to convert in-game items to cash or to trade them means that they attain a real-world value and become articles of money or worth. Where gambling facilities are offered to British consumers, including the use of in-game items that can be converted into cash or traded, a gambling license is required. Tackling operators making gambling facilities available to children is one of the Gambling Commission's priorities. This has been demonstrated by action taken against unlicensed websites providing facilities for gambling using in-game items as methods for payment. For the purposes of this survey, with the aim of ensuring comprehension, the topic was introduced to young people as follows. When playing computer games slash mobile apps, it is sometimes possible to collect in-game items, weapons, power-ups, tokens. Respondents were then asked if they were aware of different ways of using in-game items and if they ever had personally used in-game items in these ways. Overall, 54% of 11 to 16-year-olds were aware of the, of the possibility to pay money or use in-game items to open loot boxes. 31% had done so. Boys were significantly more likely, 64% versus 43%, to be aware of this type of usage. Somewhat fewer people were aware that it is possible to bet on in-game items on websites outside of a game, and 3% claim to have done this. So this graph shows that... claim to have actually done the uh, skins betting, and that seems to be the extent of that section. (laughs) It does not seem to go into loot boxes. Let me see where loot boxes might come back into this. I checked, and the word loot is only four times in the document. Yep, it does not. So this study is really not a study about loot box gambling, not just the usage of loot boxes. They're saying that only 3% have actually gambled on in-game items 
using websites outside of the game or privately with friends. So only 15% were aware you could do that, but 3%. Now, 3% is 20% of 15%, so maybe if that 15% became more like 50%, we'd see the 3% increase to 10. Does that make any sense? Uh, There's not a direct correlation there, but we don't know. So that would be a concern of mine, would be as children became aware that you could bet with this stuff. So then what do you do about all of this? Well, if I, if I have my data correctly here, Belgium has cracked down on loot boxes, which was in the news a little while ago, but it has now forced Final Fantasy and Kingdom Hearts out of Belgium. They are no longer available for sale to citizens of Belgium because violations of the law could be met with prison sentences of five years and $910,000 or $800,000 euros. Uh, The ministry says mixing games and gambling, especially at a young age, is dangerous for mental health. This is why we must ensure that children and adults are not confronted with games of chance when they are looking for fun in a video game. And the, the issue here that I see isn't that they're offering in-game rewards for playing the game. It's that they're offering in-game rewards that are tied to a random chance and then allowing you to spend money to buy more random chances. That's remarkably like gambling. You're not necessarily getting a cash reward in all cases, so it's not like casino gambling down the street from me where I can go put 20 bucks in and have a chance at getting more than 20 bucks out or a chance at, you know, lining the pockets of the casino. Much better chance at that, by the way. Also, if you didn't know, they set those odds. The the casino chooses those odds and every slot machine can have different odds. So it's not like you can walk into, this slot feels hot to me. No, no, no. There's a computer chip in there that is coldly calculating whatever they told it to do. It is that arbitrary where they can say this slot hits you know, once every 20 pulls, and this slot hits once every 10. It's not once every 10, as in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and the 10th time it hits. It's a random number generator. And the state gaming commissions will maintain the integrity of that random number generator. But the casino sets the odds, and you should know that. If you want to play slots, you're playing against arbitrarily set odds. You're no longer playing against mechanically set odds or any sort of random chance. So, FYI. But the point is, when you trigger this conditioning mechanic, the brain that you are triggering it against needs to be mature enough to understand what's going on. And if you asked our if you asked our staffer Nate, our moderator Nate, about this, he would love to tell you all about Skinner boxes, but he is not here this morning, so I'm going to do it instead. Otherwise known as an operant conditioning chamber. I'm serious. This is not just for fun. You need to know about this. This is a real thing that happens to people, and and this is how it happens. Operant conditioning is basically neuro linguistic programming is basically a way you can condition a brain. You have to have an incentive, basically an incentive of any kind, but the more valuable the incentive to the subject of the conditioning, the better. In dog training, we say use the smelliest, juiciest, tastiest treat you can. And you'll break off little morsels of it because you want to make it last as long as possible and you don't want to make your dog fat. But we're not worried about those practicalities here. You take the juiciest, tastiest morsel and you train your dogs using that. And dog dog trainers, such as me, will tell you that you must time the reward to precisely coincide with the subject's understanding that it is being rewarded for the proper behavior. This is conditioning. It gets a reward when it does the desired behavior. And this is the proper way to train a dog as opposed to punishing it when it does the undesired behavior. And when we reward something for doing the desired behavior, we call it positive reinforcement. And it is a much better, but also much more hands-on way of training a dog. Well, in psychology, we call this operant conditioning. And a Skinner box is a 
particular kind of conditioning. It's a chamber, a box, that was created by Dr. B.F. Skinner, a graduate student at Harvard University, who I'm calling doctor because I'm assuming he's a doctor by now. And he put a rat in a cage, had it pull a lever or step on a pedal, and then would give it a reward. Uh, in his, in this Skinner box, he has lights and things. In other Skinner type boxes, you would have it give the rat a food pellet. The concept of operant conditioning is a very powerful tool. And it's more powerful than we've revealed in just talking about a Skinner box for five seconds. If, if you stomp on a pedal and get a food pellet and you're a simple brain that is, that is ready for that kind of thing, you know, maybe, maybe you, the lawful masses viewer, don't care about a food pellet. But let's say it's a loot box and you really want that skin for your AK-47 or you really want that pair of shorts or something in Fortnite or in PUBG so you can show off how cool you are, right? Well, you're willing to press that button a few times. If you, if you got the skin you wanted when you pressed the button, great. There's almost no excessive operant conditioning going on there. The direct operant conditioning that's going on is that I pay the money or I press this button, I get a reward. Um, another kind of operant conditioning would be ch winner, winner, chicken dinner. You don't get the chicken dinner unless you win. So you're conditioned to seek the win and you only get the reward when you actually get the win. Well, what if we change this up a little bit? What if you don't get the chicken dinner every time? What if you get the chicken dinner, and it would obviously have to be, be, be made more valuable to compensate for this, what if you only got the chicken dinner once every three wins? What if the chicken dinner was very valuable? What if it was $100? And instead of getting $100 for a PUBG win every time, you got $100 for a PUBG win every three wins. Well, now you'd be playing a little bit more trying to get to that third win, right? Well, now back up a second. What if it's a random number of wins? What if you could get it every win, but then maybe it's every five or ten wins? Well, now there's this sort of extra or logarithmic or exponential scale that comes into effect where instead of it just being, well, we've magnified the operant conditioning by 10 times or by three times or by whatever. Now it's being magnified by more like a hundred times or more. In fact, in Skinner boxes that did this, they were pretty much able to get the rat to kill itself using the random, the random stomp method, and then eventually removing the, the reward. So you'd get a rat to stomp on a, a pedal or, or flip a switch in order to get the desired stimuli, the reward. You would then, you would change that conditioning into a random number generator where it did not get the reward until it stomped on the pedal you know, 10 times this time, three times next time, 40 times next time, two times next time, one time next time, 60 times next time. And when you then removed the reward from the rat, if it had been conditioned where it got a reward every time, it stomped on it 10 times. If it had been conditioned that it got a reward every three or four stomps, it stomped on it 100 times. If it had been conditioned randomly, it would stomp on the pedal thousands of times before figuring out that it was not getting a reward. So what are loot boxes doing? They are preying on that most vulnerable kind of Skinner box operant conditioning vulnerability. They are preying on the worst kind of psychological vulnerability. And that is why you shouldn't do this to children and probably should disclose this to adults in a, in a more clear fashion. In psychology, we call this um, a, a random interval and random reward schedule, which sounds very technical. But the idea is that the most addictive, the most, most habit forming is when you can't predict when you're going to get a good prize and you can't predict the value of the prize so 
it's it's that thing like how many times do you have to stop the pedal till you get a prize how many times do you have to get a prize before you get a really good one when you vary that up you just you you keep on holding out hope for the big prize yep and that makes you keep going for it and keep going for it because there's always that chance you lose the predictability and it makes it more obsessive to get at it and it's that hope that's rewarding. Um, somebody in the chat had said, oh, well, you know, if you lose some money, then that would like uh, guide you away from gambling, right? Nope. Nope. You actually get the reward in your brain before you find out the results of your gambling. Yep. So it's the anticipation that you could get the reward that releases all of that good yeah. stuff in your brain and so even if you lose almost every time as long as there's the hope that you could win big you still get the brain reward this works in reverse with trauma as well uh a a if you are randomly subjected to small traumas or large traumas uh this has the exact same effect you you become the opposite the adverse to you know things on on a there were three orders of magnitude level and, and you sense that you're overly sensitive to those events happening. So in terms of, of trauma, if, if you're used to an environment that is very unpredictable, then you're always anticipating that the big bad could be coming. Yeah. So in terms of loot boxes, this would be like, maybe they, they start you off at level one. You're getting these nice boxes that everybody gets that has these cool rewards in them. And at level five, you're getting ones that have like lower odds and lower odds and lower odds, right? That that's also a thing that's done. Yes, as they uh, as you progress, they remove the rewards, F and it doesn't matter because fewer people are going to progress anyway. So let's save up all the time and effort for the rewards for the people who are going to be, you know, the sixty six or eighty seven percent of our people who are going to play the game only for a couple hours, and the rest of you guys who want end game content, well, you're really only about ten twenty percent of the players, if that. So why I care about you and you're allowed to use conditioning and marketing it's when you cross this line into making it feel and seem like gambling and using psychological concepts against people at that level where i start to think hmm maybe we shouldn't allow children to be subjected to psychological concepts we certainly we don't want them to smoke weed we don't want them to drink alcohol we don't want them to we really don't want them to have, you know, unprotected or uninformed sex. Why would we want them to be subjected to Skinner boxes and not be informed about it? So that's our show, everyone. Thank you for joining me. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Thank you especially to our November Patreon supporters, not the least of which is Justin Rogers, supporting at the $500 level. Justin has reached out to us about what he wants to, us to talk about, and I will be in touch with you, Justin. I'm sorry, we've just been very, very uh, busy. Also, thank you to the $50 plus supporters, Jonathan Doe, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Kyle Mudrock, Evie, Andy, Vera Montaigne, Sean McNamara, William Gonzalez, Michael Pierce, Terry Crisp, Richard Fournier, AK a breakfast demon spirit bear Jan negre and Jax merrick and thank you to the five dollar plus supporters that will be scrolling on the screen and are scrolling on the led panel behind me ms kaylee is also doing a sleep rough in the park thing for charity if you would like to donate please visit uk.virginmoneygiving.com slash miss k p a v d that's m i s s k p a v d i was gonna mention it if you weren't going to today because I think it's an interesting, it's a, it's a really, really good thing that Kaylee's doing. And so we'll give everyone an opportunity to donate to Ms. Kaylee for her night in the park. So have a great weekend, have a great Sunday, have a great week, and I'll see you in the videos that drop and on our next show. Love you all. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Thank you for joining me. Have a good one.